This is Dr. Robert C. Newman in his short course, The Miraculous and the Miracles of Jesus. Lecture number six, The Miracles of Jesus Over the Human Realm. Okay, we're continuing uh, our course, uh, The Miraculous and the Miracles of Jesus. Uh, we've looked already at the uh, four lectures on the miraculous, uh, <clears throat> looking at uh, a quick survey of Old and New Testament miracles, then at a uh, survey of extra-biblical miracles uh, in Christendom, and then thirdly at the rise of science and theological liberalism, and fourthly at responding to objections to the miraculous. We started last time then as our fifth lecture, the uh, miracles of Jesus uh, over the uh, natural realm, <clears throat> and now this second one is the miracles of Jesus over the human realm. <clears throat> Here, we're going to look at miracles dealing with human sickness and death. Such miracles include the healing of the nobleman's son, the woman with the hemorrhage, raising Jairus' daughter, healing a paralytic, cleansing a leper, <clears throat> the centurion's servant, raising a widow's son, healing at the pool of Bethesda, uh, the man born blind, uh, the man with a withered hand, the ten lepers, the deaf and dumb fellow, and raising Lazarus. As before, we'll only do some of these that are not in our other PowerPoint talks, uh, which are uh, uh, otherwise found on our IBRI website, www.ibri.org. We look, first of all, at the healing of the nobleman's son, found in John 4. And uh, <clears throat> here's the uh, passage, John 4, 46 through 50. Once more he, that is Jesus, visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see miraculous signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus replied, you may go, your son will live. The man took Jesus at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and all his household believed. This was the second miraculous sign that Jesus performed, having come from Judea to Galilee. Well, think about the historicity of the event a little. The occasion, this is after Jesus returned from Judea and Samaria into Galilee. It's in the pleading of the Father, a uh, sort of quasi-liberal explanation of the uh, thing Jesus telepathically gave the boy the will to live. Uh, liberals in recent years have backed away from that sort of stuff, but still might talk of psychosomatic healing or something. <clears throat> uh, evidence of historicity, uh, this is a royal official or a relative of the royal family. Uh, was he the chusa of Luke 8.3? Don't know. Uh, the verb come down, verse 47. Uh, <clears throat> Capernaum is down by the lakeside and Cana is well up the uh, hill and about 20 miles off. So uh, uh, that indicates some knowledge of the uh, geography, if you like and then the time indications that uh, uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, Father uh, uh, hears Jesus say that at the seventh hour. Uh, that does get us into the question of uh, what kind of time notations John uses. Uh, my own thought in that direction after looking at some of the passages is that John actually uses the Roman system, uh, which is rather like ours, so this is either seven in the morning or seven in the evening, and since it's yesterday, it's probably seven in the evening, and then the father goes back and arrives sometime the next day. <clears throat> uh, the development of the father's faith is seen here as well. Uh, in verse 47, he wants the, uh, the Jesus to come down, <clears throat> but then in verse 50, he accepts Jesus' word, and at Jesus' word that the son uh, will live, uh, he turns back and goes home. And then uh, when he finds out when 
the sun began to get better in verse 52. Uh, we see then that as a result of that he believed, verse 53. Reaction to the eyewitnesses. Only the father saw both sides of the incident, <clears throat> but he independently checked the time. The servants in the household knew of the sudden end of the fever, and the father and the household both believed. <clears throat> Old Testament background. Well, what kind of similar miracles do we have to this? Uh, well, the healing from serpents in Numbers 21, uh, the leprosy of Miriam in Numbers 12, <clears throat> the leprosy of Naaman, 2 Kings 5. Okay, these are all healings, huh? Uh, the healing of Hezekiah in 2 Kings 20. <clears throat> Uh, the request regarding the healing of Abijah, 1 Kings 14. <clears throat> and at least one of these, Naaman, was healing at a distance. Uh, that is, that uh, Elijah was not there when Naaman was actually healed. <clears throat> Some other parallels. Uh, Psalm 103.3 tells us that the Lord heals all your diseases. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases. The curses of the covenant include diseases and fever, Leviticus 26, 16. I'll start at verse 15. And if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring upon you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and drain away your life. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. Significance. Well, the immediate effect, Jesus speaks of the relation of signs and wonders to faith, that uh, sometimes uh, people need something like that uh, to uh, uh, cause them to trust God more, to believe, etc., trust Jesus. <clears throat> Note the healing is about 20 miles away. Uh, the boy is, boy is healed, verse 52. The father is brought to faith, verses 47, 48, 50, 53. Also the household. 53. So, the immediate effects, uh, boy healed, father, and the household brought to faith, and uh, this, uh, uh, tr when the father trusts Jesus and heads home, uh, then the boy is healed. Place in salvation history. Is this Jesus' first healing? First one mentioned in John, but probably not. Uh, John 2.23 uh, suggests that Jesus had been doing healings uh, elsewhere. Hmm? probably means it's the second Galilean sign. First healing in Galilee, then. <clears throat> Symbolic elements, nothing obvious. Uh, you could contrast the father with Abraham, uh, but uh, <clears throat> Abraham is ready to give his son, and the father is uh, here is very concerned, not ready, if you like. You can contrast the father with God. Uh, God gave his son. Miracles of Jesus often look back at creation or forward to the end of the age. Uh, well, uh, <clears throat> many of the, uh, all of the uh, miracles of healing certainly look back at the fall of man and the resultant uh, sickness and death that uh, are a result of that, and Jesus is uh, turning these back, so to speak. And uh, in this sense, they also look forward to the end of the age when uh, everybody will be raised from the dead and there will be no more sickness and uh, dying and such. <clears throat> move on to uh, a second uh, example of Jesus' uh, miracles over the human realm, the healing of the paralytic in Matthew 9, Mark 2, and Luke 5. I uh, take a look here at the uh, passage in Mark chapter 2. <clears throat> a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. So many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. Some men came bringing to him a paralytic, carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat uh, the paralyzed man was lying on. <clears throat> when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, 
to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We've never seen anything like this. <clears throat> Think of the occasional event. It's not clear from the divergence of Matthew and Mark when this occurred, but apparently it was just before Matthew's conversion. Evidence of historicity. Uh, this occurs in three Gospels in such a form as to suggest they're not copied from one another. The details of time are vague, but it took place in Capernaum. Uh, the number of men given, uh, though natural, uh, is a significant four of them are carrying him. Uh, notice it uh, actually doesn't say that's all there were. Uh, some men brought uh, brought this fellow being carried by four of them. Okay, So there might well have been uh, several beside the four. Opening the roof is certainly unusual. <clears throat> Reaction to the eyewitnesses. The Pharisees grumble at the claim to forgive sin, but they're apparently silenced when the miracle worked. <clears throat> paralytic goes away glorifying God. The others are astonished, fearful, glorify God, remark on the uniqueness and strangeness of the event. What kind of Old Testament background do we have here? Some similar miracles. Well, you remember Jeroboam's hand is shriveled up and restored in 1 Kings 13 uh, when uh, he is rebuked by the man of God from uh, Judah who's come up uh, to speak against uh, the uh, this false worship center, if you like, that Jeroboam has set up. Uh, Isaiah 53, 6 says that the lame are to leap like the deer at the time of Israel's redemption. Some other parallels. Uh, well, in Leviticus 21, 18, lameness and such disqualify one for the priesthood. And forgiveness can only be given by God and by the person sinned against, see basic teaching of the Old Testament, and which is why uh, these uh, Pharisees uh, react like this. Huh? Uh, you know, it's not obvious that Jesus is the one sinned against, and so what's he making himself to be? God? You know, if I uh, were to forgive some sin that you that somebody did to you, but it wasn't me, and etc., uh, you would think the same thing. Huh? Significance. Immediate effect, the fellow's healed. Uh, there's an attestation of Jesus' claim to forgive sins. Uh, his remark about harder, I think, basically has the idea that uh, uh, anyone can say someone's sins are forgiven, and we don't find out whether they are or not to the last judgment, uh, but uh, uh, <clears throat> he will then do something that you can see the effects of in order to see that indeed he does have power. Place in salvation history. The one who forgives sin has become man something we see here. Hmm? Symbolic elements. Compare Isaiah 35, 6, which points to the eschaton. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. So uh, uh, we get here, and this is not an uncommon feature in Jesus' miracles, that they either point back to what God did in creation, uh, like thinking of the uh, turning water into wine, if you like, or they look forward to what will happen at the end of the age. So here, now, this lame man leaps like the deer, if you like. <clears throat> we move on to uh, a third miracle over the uh, uh, human realm, cleansing the leper, Matthew 8, Mark 1, Luke 5. Here we look at the Matthew uh, uh, account, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 8. <clears throat> when he came down from the mountainside, Large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy, and the NIV a footnote indicates the Greek word was used for various diseases affecting the skin, uh, not necessarily what we would call leprosy today. Uh, <clears throat> a man with leprosy came and knelt down before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately he was cured uh, of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, See that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Historicity event. Occasion, Matthew seems to be the most definite, putting it after the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 8.1. 
Mark and Luke are vague, but still early in Galilean ministry. The fellow seeks Jesus out. <clears throat> Liberal explanations. Well, there's some uncertainty regarding the exact nature of the disease. <clears throat> the Hebrew and Greek terms are said are broader than Hansen's disease, which itself has several types. <clears throat> Liberals tend to opt for milder forms and a psychological cure of some sort. Matthew seems to locate the event near the site of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Mark and Luke out from Capernaum on a Galilean tour. Reaction eyewitnesses are not specified. The leper is apparently so overwhelmed, he doesn't obey Jesus' instructions not to spread the news of his cure. Mark 1, 43-45 indicates this for us. It's not in our Matthew passage. You might wonder... Uh, why Jesus said uh, to go show yourself, etc. first, but I think uh, he says himself why that is just a testimony to them. Uh, he wanted this person to show up who had clearly been cleansed of leprosy before they found out who did it. And that way, uh, not uh, if there's any bias there among the priests against him, that uh, this would, they would already have uh, verified it before they found out uh, uh, what it was all about. <clears throat> Old Testament background, well, uh, what do we have? We have some similar miracles. We have healings from leprosy. You remember Moses' hand that he sticks in his garment, brings out, and it becomes leprous, and he sticks it back in and brings it out, and it's uh, uh, no longer leprous, Exodus 14. Uh, Miriam uh, struck with leprosy in Numbers 10 and then uh, healed. Uh, Naaman in 2 Kings 5. So uh, several healings from leprosy in the Old Testament. Some other parallels. Uh, Luke 13 is the diagnosis of leprosy in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and then in Luke uh, in Leviticus 13. And then in Leviticus 14, the cleansing testimony, uh, a cleansing ceremony, excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, if you look at Luke uh, Leviticus 14 there and compare it with uh, touching the dead, <clears throat> uh, the cleansing ceremony lasts eight days and includes some final offerings. Significance, immediate effect, the man is cleansed, his faith is rewarded. Jesus' compassion is seen, his concern for the law and, ceremony, and the ceremony as testimony. Uh, is Jesus concerned to avoid the wrong kind of publicity? That may be what's going on here. Place in salvation history, like Moses and Elisha, one who heals lepers again, walks the earth. In contrast, Jesus touches the leper who is cleansed, rather than rendering Jesus unclean. Parallel with the resurrections by Elijah and Elisha. One might, of course, argue, well, maybe Jesus took that uncleanness upon himself, and that's a possibility, too. We weren't there, and uh, we can't see that, thing any, that sort of thing anyway. I don't know the answer to that for sure. Symbolic elements. <clears throat> Surprisingly, although I'd heard of it all my life, I could not find clear evidence of the symbolic value of leprosy. Uh, <clears throat> Psalm 51, verses 5 through 7, which I think was the best candidate, is not obviously referring to leprosy. Uh, <clears throat> Surely I was sinful at birth, says David, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. So we do see some kind of cleansing ceremony pictured here by David, but there's no explicit statement that uh, leprosy is symbolic of sin or something like that. So although it's not an unreasonable guess, uh, I would have thought that the evidence for that was much stronger given how many times I've heard that one time or another. <clears throat> we move on to the healing at the Pool of Bethesda, John 5. <clears throat> Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for feast of the Jews. Now there is in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed, and then, uh, uh, as the uh, uh, note in NIV points out, some less important manuscripts add... And they waited for the moving of the waters. From time to time, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir the waters. The first one into the pool after each such disturbance would be cured of whatever disease he had. And then back to uh, uh, more uh, 
a certain text. Uh, one who was there uh, had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool. Uh, when the water is stirred, while I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. Once the man was cured, he picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jews said to the man who had been healed, It's the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So they asked him, Who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd and was there. Later, Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you're well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jews it was Jesus who had made him well. So, because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Well, historicity of the event, the occasion, during a feast of the Jews. Uh, several feasts have been suggested, even Purim. We're not really sure which one it was. A few months to a year after the events of John 4. Jesus sees a fellow who is lame or something of the sort and heals him on the Sabbath. Liberal explanations, psychosomatic healing. Or didn't happen at all, uh, two standard ones uh, for liberals responding to miracles. Evidence of historicity, the location is now well established, though the site was unknown even in 1900. Recent archaeological work has cleared that up. Uh, the reaction of the Jewish leaders fits rabbinic views about the Sabbath. <clears throat> the poorly attested verse 4 regarding the angel suggests the place was well known in tradition from before AD 70. Uh, uh, <clears throat> reaction of the eyewitnesses the fellow himself seems grateful, uh, verses 11 and 15. Uh, verse 15, I think, should not be understood that he was malicious, uh, that uh, angry that he got into trouble for carrying his mat and so uh, found out who Jesus was and went and reported it, but rather that he wanted the uh, people to know that Jesus had done this. <clears throat> the Jewish leaders see only a violation of Sabbath, uh, later compounded in verse 17 by what they view as blasphemy. <clears throat> Old Testament background. Similar miracles. There are no references to healing on the Sabbath in the Old Testament. <clears throat> Both Elijah and Elisha touched dead people to raise them. Other materials, lots of Sabbath regulations, Exodus 23, 31, 35, Numbers 15, Nehemiah 13, Jeremiah 17. There's no manna on the Sabbath, you remember, Exodus 16, 22 through 29. <clears throat> but the priests labor on the Sabbath, Numbers 28, 9 through 10. Uh, the lame are to walk. When redemption comes, Isaiah 35, 6. Significance, what's the immediate effect? <clears throat> well, a man is healed. <clears throat> Controversy develops between Jesus and the leaders, resulting in strong opposition to him for his actions and claims. Place in salvation history. Jesus makes claims before the official representatives of the nation. He bases his authority over the Sabbath on his unique relation to the Father. Symbolic elements. Well, one possibility is, should we view the Sabbath as a symbol of the eschaton, a symbol of the end of the age? That, there's some warrant for that. Healing is eschatological. We certainly got warrant for that, that God is going to heal and take away all disease and death and such. God works on the Sabbath. Interesting, hmm? Especially as regards redemption. And uh, that surely is part of what Jesus is saying to them. That uh, the thing that uh, uh, angers them, if they like, is in fact God's work of redemption. We move on to the man born blind, John 9. <clears throat> As he, Jesus, went along, he saw a man blind from birth. 
His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who said, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, not meaning they had never sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it's a de- it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am the world, I am the light of the world. <clears throat> Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool, Siloam. And uh, John points out this word Siloam means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open? they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. <clears throat> they brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see you. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He's a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he's our son, the parents answered, and we know he's born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That is why his parents said, He is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God. Uh, If you look at uh, Joshua 7.19, this is a solemn charge to tell the truth or even to confess, if you like. They said, We know this man is a sinner. The fellow replied, Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I've told you already, and you didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses. But as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. When he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. Well, that's an impressively long uh, miracle account. <clears throat> Occasion at Jerusalem, whether the Feast of Tabernacles, narrated in chapter 7 and 8, or the Feast of Dedication, Hanukkah, uh, narrated in chapter 10. Jesus and his disciples see this man born blind, presumably begging, verse 8. <clears throat> the disciples ask the question about the cause of the ailment. Uh, Jesus heals him. Liberal explanations, invented. 
psychosomatic <clears throat> evidence of historicity. Well, the terms rabbi, Pharisee, Siloam, the Sabbath controversy involving spittle and clay making, details the investigation, the excommunication, the Hebraism, give glory to God, uh, compare Joshua 7.19, the perceptive picture of human psychology regarding the blind man, the parents, the neighbors, the Pharisees for that matter, and the Pharisees' behavior. Reaction of the eyewitnesses. Well, there's the growing faith of a blind man, the growing disbelief of the Pharisees, though they're still divided at this point, but they will be divided all the way up to the end. So, uh, Joseph, Arimathea, and uh, Nicodemus uh, clearly are uh, favorable to Jesus, though they're rather reluctant to advertise it by the, uh, as the polarization grows. Mm. Dispute among the neighbors over the fellow's identity. Mm kind of Old Testament background that we have. Similar miracles, there are no cases of healing the blind narrated in the Old Testament, which is perhaps why the fellow said, uh, no, this has never happened before. Uh, no narrations, huh? Other, <clears throat> well, there's Exodus 4.11 and Psalm 146.8, where it says, God makes blind and heals. And then in Isaiah 29.18 and 35.5, the blind will be healed at the end of the age. And in Isaiah 42.7, the uh, uh, servant passages of Isaiah, uh, <clears throat> uh, people are to be healed by God's servant. So God makes blind and heals. Uh, Exodus 4.11, 12. The Lord said to him, talking to Moses, Who gave man his mouth? Who makes him deaf or mute? Who gives him sight or makes him blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go. I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. Psalm 146, 8. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Blind healed in the eschaton. Isaiah 29, 18. In that day the deaf will hear the words of the scroll. And out of gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind will see. In Isaiah 35, 5. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. And then in the servant passage, Isaiah 42, 5 through 7. This is what the Lord says, He who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and all that comes out of it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you, called the servant, in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. Well, significance of the miracle, the immediate effect again, the fellow is healed, but he also faces persecution and apparently came to salvation. The Pharisees are forced to deal with the matter. They refuse to accept Christ's claims, and so as a result they're driven further away. A, a significant feature that one, when one refuses to deal with very strong evidence, uh, you wind up then becoming even more in opposition and more dogmatic and such place in salvation history. Again shows the uniqueness of Christ in relationship to Moses, Elijah, and Elisha. Also we see a strong theme of judgment and deliverance. <clears throat> Symbolic elements, pretty clear at the end of the chapter, huh? at the end of the passage. Uh, physical light and vision, darkness and blindness stand for spiritual vision and spiritual blindness. See that verse 5, verse 39 through 41, and compare Isaiah 42, 16 through 19, and Isaiah 59, 10. This Jesus making clay, that's an interesting uh, a phenomenon there, <clears throat> and uh, something that struck me uh, some years after I first, uh, uh, you know, after I thought about this for some time, was uh, uh, <clears throat> Genesis, not clear in the English translation, but God makes clay to form man takes the dusty earth and he molds it is the term. It's the uh, yatsar, same term used uh, for uh, uh, in the noun form for potter, okay? Yeah, makes clay to form man. Huh? So what we have there is a picture of Jesus uh, making clay to recreate the fellow's vision or something of that sort. And of course that's a fairly strong statement about who Jesus is then. Uh, 
uh, the one who in the beginning uh, made Adam out of clay and brought him to life here, uh, uh, puts clay over the fellow's eyes and brings his vision to life, if you like. <clears throat> Raising a Lazarus, John 11. <clears throat> now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sister sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there for two more days. Then he said to his disciples, Let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews tried to stone you, and yet you're going back there? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours of daylight? A man who walks by day will not stumble, for he sees by this world's light. It is when he walks by night that he stumbles, for he has no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, called Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus was, had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, he went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you're the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After, And after she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you, hear, that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth about his face. Jesus said to him, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit no, excuse me. Oh, yeah. Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told him what Jesus had done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing? they asked. Here is this man performed many miraculous signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away our place and our nation. Then one of them, named Caiaphas, 
who was high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. You do not realize it's better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. He did not say this on his own, but as high priest that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation, and not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of God, to bring them together and make them one. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Well, historicity of these events. <clears throat> the occasion, just a few months before the crucifixion, at the end of Jesus' Purian ministry. Jesus is at Bethany beyond Jordan when the message reaches him. <clears throat> he waits two days before going to Bethany near Jerusalem. Liberal explanations, Lazarus was not really dead. So it's a resuscitation or a plot. Uh, or the parable of Lazarus and the rich man was made into a narrative. Or it was a myth or allegory. However, the character of Mary and Martha matches that that we see in Luke. And the location of Bethany near Jerusalem and the other place names fit what we know about uh, Israel at the time. The details of the narrative, including the reaction of the enemies in reference to the blind man, uh, all fit the historicity of this. <clears throat> reaction of the eyewitnesses. Many Jews who saw the event come to believe. Some report the incident of the Pharisees. Similar miracles, Old Testament background. Resurrection of the widow's son in 1 Kings 17 by Elijah. Resurrection of the Shunammite's son, 2 Kings 4, by Elisha. Resurrection of the man by Elisha's bones, 2 Kings 13. All of these were rather recently dead. Uh, here, Lazarus is four days dead and presumably then has in fact begun to decay. Some other parallels. Uh, the uncleanness conveyed by touching the dead, Numbers 19, 11 through 12. Eschatological materials on the resurrection, Daniel 12, 2, Isaiah 26, 19. Explicit connection of this resurrection with the end of the age, verses 23 through 26. Significance, meeting effect, Lazarus is raised, the family is restored. Sets in motion the decision of the Sanhedrin to kill Jesus. Place in salvation history? The only addition to the other resurrection accounts, accounts is a statement of Jesus as the resurrection and the life. Certainly uh, non-trivial. Hmm? Symbolic elements. Here the eschatological significance is brought out in verses 23 through 26. Some people have wondered, uh, you know, why Jesus remained two days before he uh, went uh, to Lazarus. Uh, well, we see when he gets there, G uh, Lazarus has been in the tomb four days already. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> apparently Lazarus was, uh, well, we don't know the travel time, but probably Lazarus was already dead by the time that uh, the messenger reached Jesus. <clears throat> of course, then, uh, Jesus' answer to the messenger, uh, this is not unto death, must have seemed quite strange to the messenger when he got back and Lazarus had been dead, and uh, to Mary and Martha uh, when uh, they got the message. But uh, Jesus uh, uh, lets us occasionally uh, think strange things in order to uh, realize later that God really is in control. Well, that's our quick tour of uh, some of the examples of Jesus' miraculous power over the human realm. We have one more area we will want to look at here in just a bit, and that's Jesus' power over the uh, spirit realm. But we'll stop for now. This is Dr. Robert C. Newman in his short course, The Miraculous and the Miracles of Jesus. Lecture number six, The Miracles of Jesus over the Human Realm.